Thank you, Peter. Thank you for having me. It's great to be back. 43 years ago this month, I was in your shoes. I had just joined the PhD program. It was called Biomedical Sciences here at Mount Sinai. And we didn't have a white coat ceremony. Just threw mine out the other day, actually. It was getting pretty dirty. It was an exciting time. 43 years, now that's a long time. But looking back, one thing I do realize is how completely clueless I was. I didn't know very much about scientific research. I didn't know what I'd be doing one day, but it didn't matter. I was curious, I was enthusiastic, and it all worked out. Now you may ask, how could it have worked out if you were clueless? And my answer is mentors. I found people who I trusted, and I listened to what they told me. Let me give you an example from my career. I just graduated from Cornell in 1974. I didn't know what to do with my life. Uh, I went back home. I knew I liked science, so I got a job as a microbiology lab technician. I loved the work, but I soon realized I didn't know anything, so I had to go back to school. Then I read a book called Fever, which is about the discovery of Lassa virus in the 1960s and I fell in love with viruses. Remember, I'm living at home, I don't have a support network, I don't have any advisors, so on my own I figured out, well, maybe I need to get a master's degree, so I started applying to programs in the area. Then one night in August 1975, I went to dinner at Ed Kilborn's home. Ed and I were undergraduates at Cornell, we had become friends, and his parents lived nearby. Now, some of you may recognize the name, Ed's father, Edwin, was for many years chair of microbiology here at Mount Sinai. And after dinner, Dr. Kilburn said, Vinny, what are you gonna do with your life? I remember those words. You even called me Vinny. I told him I wanted to work on viruses, which probably pleased him enormously since he was a virologist. And I said I was applying to master's programs. He said, forget about that. Come to Mount Sinai and get your PhD. The next week I interviewed, and the week later I moved into a dorm on 96th and 1st Avenue. After three lab rotations, I entered Peter's lab for my research. Again, I trusted someone's advice. They said, work with Peter. It's going to be great. And when I was ready to leave Peter's lab, I said, who should I work for? And he said, only the best, David Baltimore. So at each stage of my career, I found mentors who I trusted, and I listened to them. So my advice to you is, find a mentor you trust and listen. It doesn't do any good if you don't listen to them. To this day, I seek out mentors and listen to them. And to this day, when either Peter or David say, jump, I ask, how high? Right? <laughs> You're just beginning what I think is the best career you can have, a career in science. Notice, I didn't call it a job because it's not. Nor are you entitled to a career in science. It's a privilege, not a right. You have to earn that right, and to do so won't be easy. You'll work harder than most of your peers, and you'll make a lot less money. But a career in science is not about money. It's about changing the world. Many humans live long and healthy lives because of science. Not all of you will make seminal discoveries like discovering reverse transcriptase or CRISPR-Cas, but not all of you will enter basic research either. Nevertheless, you'll all play some role in advancing science, whether at the bench, in business, or even in communication. 43 years in science have taught me a lot of other important lessons. One worth telling you is that science is not about you. It's not about building a big lab. It's not about scoring a lot of research money. It's not about scoring papers in prominent journals or even winning a Nobel Prize. It is about discovery. It is about understanding how life works and everything else is second to that goal. Sometimes your discoveries will improve human lives, but that won't always be your goal. In the 43 years behind me, a new phrase has crept into the science lexicon, and that's translational research. This means nothing more than doing research that has a direct use, like making a vaccine or curing a disease. The problem is that the public has come to believe that translational research is all there is or all that there should be. They don't understand that 
translational research stems from discoveries that were not intended to cure anything, but were the fruits of a scientist's curiosity. Abraham Flexner recognized this problem way back in 1939 in an essay he wrote called The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge, and I'll quote from that. I am not for a moment suggesting that everything that goes on in laboratories will ultimately turn to some unexpected practical use or that an ultimate practical use is its actual justification. Much more, I am pleading for the abolition of the word use and for the freeing of the human spirit. And he goes on to say, we have taken Hale and Rutherford and Einstein and their peers millions upon millions of miles into the uttermost realms of space and on the other loose to boundless energy imprisoned in the atom. What they have done out of sheer curiosity has transformed human life. The key is to have the right balance between what I'll call curiosity-driven fundamental research and translational research. I'm not sure that most people realize this. I'll bet that members of Congress, which of course appropriates much of the biomedical research dollars in this country, don't either. It's a problem you're going to have to deal with in your careers. I want to tell you about a few other problems with science. They will affect your careers, and maybe your generation will solve them. The first concerns the publication of scientific findings, the very means by which our careers advance. You need to publish your work in journals because that's how you'll be judged at every step of your career whether it be finding a new job, getting grant support, getting tenure, and much more. We wouldn't have a problem if you were judged solely by the contents of your papers. Unfortunately, you are often judged, sometimes in addition to, sometimes only by, which journal the work is published in. This issue was less of a problem when I was a PhD student, but has grown substantially in the past 43 years. Over that time, publishers have learned that they can make billions of dollars in profit by publishing our work. The elite journals, Science, Cell, and Nature, and their derivatives maintain an exclusive cachet by limiting the number of papers they review and publish. This practice inflates the journal impact factor, a supposed measure of the impact of work in the field. The problem is that not all good science is published in these luxury journals, and not all of what they publish is good. Yet when it comes to hiring, promotion, and funding, the committees involved make decisions based on the journal and often not the contents of the paper. In other words, the professional editors of luxury journals are playing an enormous role in crucial decisions about our careers. I hope you'll agree with me that this is unacceptable. I prefer that my scientific colleagues make the decisions about my career. The luxury journals have a grip on our careers, which they don't want to relax because it is a lucrative grip, but the practice has to stop. There's another problem in scientific publishing which revolves around the fact that the research we do is largely supported by tax dollars, but many journals keep scientific papers behind a paywall, so the public can't see what they're paying for. This practice is unacceptable, yet it drives profits for journals. Open access has been the solution to this problem, but not for all journals. The Public Library of Science and many society journals like those of the American Society for Microbiology, the Microbiology Society are open access. But the luxury journals won't make all their journals open. To do so would be to forfeit their enormous library subscription revenue. But why do these journals have to make so much money? Do we really need printed journals and why how expensive is it to review papers and simply post them online? It turns out not very much, but the problem is that the luxury journals also spend a good deal of money on the commentaries that fill up the front of each issue. Why should the cost of these be carried by scientists? Solving these two publishing problems, the impact factor and open access, will not be easy. We are partly responsible for creating them, and now we're addicted. But I think there's a solution, and I call it BioArchive with peer review. You've probably heard of BioArchive. It's essentially a server run by Cold Spring Harbor. You submit your preprints there. Everyone can see them. Eventually, they get reviewed and published in a different journal. I propose to cut out the journals. Let's add a peer reviewing system to BioArchive, keep it open access, and the cost to maintain it should be far less and could be supported by page charges and advertising. 
So the ideal science publishing platform is where the site of publication is irrelevant. What matters in the science. I, mat I envision a world where one day we don't hear congratulations on your cell paper, but rather congratulations on your paper identifying the cell receptor for poliovirus. <clears throat> Another science problem that impacts all of you and the public is science and the public. If you're like me, you bristle at the idea that there are alternative facts. We have a president who disdains science. He doesn't believe in climate change and vaccines. He took 19 months into his administration to appoint a science advisor. Much of the public is apathetic to science and wants to know nothing about it, despite the fact that it makes their lives better. I'm not sure of the source of this disdain, but one possibility is a poor science education starting in elementary school. I think scientists must take part of the blame for a science disinterested public. Few of us take the time to tell the public what we're doing. We leave that to science writers. Some of these writers do a good job, most do not, and they certainly don't have the passion that we do for the subject. And as I'm sure you surely know, passion is the key to good teaching. When I was a student, communicating science to the public was hard. The internet and social media has changed all that. It's now easy to engage the public with blogs, videos, podcasts, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and more. I've been doing this for 12 years, and I can tell you that the public wants to hear about what you do. If scientists engage the public as a single voice, we could easily drown out those who don't believe in vaccines or climate change. To touch on a problem I mentioned earlier, these venues could be used to tell your story of how curiosity drove what turned out to be a fundamental discovery. Some of my favorite stories include restriction enzymes, PCR, CRISPR-Cas. You should keep a few of them in the back of your mind for instant use in public situations. As you move forward in your career, there'll be many demands on your time, and it'll be easy for you to ignore communication. But I urge you to start now, establish good habits, there are many ways for you to communicate through writing or multimedia, or you could simply have a presence on Twitter or Facebook where much of the public is. And if you don't want to do any of that, here's a simple way to communicate your science. The next time someone asks you, what do you do? You tell them, I work for you. The con conversation will surely continue. <laughs> a career in science is an amazing journey. You get to solve problems, you get to talk with smart and clever people on a daily basis, and you help to make the world a better place. And by the way, only science does that. Not business, not law, not government. They're just facilitators for us. I wish all of you a fulfilling career in this wonderful field, and don't forget to always be curious, passionate, and kind. Thank you.